Welcome tonight here to the next session of New Covenant Theology. We're going to begin talking about Jesus. Jesus, the faithful Israelite under the Old Covenant. And as we need to do in the story of Scripture, we need to follow with the narrative as to where we are at. So to pick up the story so far, I want to talk about where we left off which is the end of the kingdom of Israel with the exile and the deportation to Babylon. In about the year uh, 600 or so, uh, Babylon came in and invaded Israel and began to take away citizens of Israel to Babylon. And then finally, with the fall of Jerusalem, uh, the last deportation was taken away in 586 B.C. And... As the prophet Jeremiah prophesied, Israel was going to spend 70 years in exile, in captivity, in a foreign land in Babylon. Well, that wasn't the only time that Israel saw uh, challenges and trials in in their history. They were then, uh, as the king of, of Persia, Cyrus, Uh, the first, came in and conquered Babylon, he then allowed the Jewish people to return to the land of Canaan and to be able to rebuild their temple. And so in 515 BC, the rebuilding of the temple was done. And if you read in the scriptures of the Old Testament, in uh, books like Ezra and Nehemiah, uh, they talk about the return of the Israelites to the land and the rebuilding of the temple and the rebuilding of the wall of Jerusalem. But then after that, we enter, we enter kind of a dearth. We enter a time period where they call it the 400 years of silence. This is the separation between Malachi and Matthew, the beginning of the New Testament where there really isn't any writings uh, of Scripture for us to understand what went on. This is called the intertestamental period. And there's a lot of history that did happen during this time, but that's not the focus here. We're going to move forward now to after the 400 years with the coming of the greatest prophet, John the Baptist. John the Baptist was the fulfillment of a prophecy that Elijah would return before the coming of the Lord. And so John the Baptist fulfills this ministry by proclaiming a message that you to prepare the way of the Lord and make straight his paths. And so John went around in the wilderness of Judea, of Israel, preaching this message to prepare for the coming of the Lord. And then finally, when the time came, the Messiah, Jesus, Jesus who is the Christ, Messiah and Christ are the same name or the same title for Jesus. He was born to Joseph and Mary in Bethlehem in Judea. And this is a prophecy I want to read you guys about the coming of Jesus. Here in Luke chapter 1, this is the prophecy of Zechariah. He says, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us In the house of his servant David, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham, to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. Jesus is this promised seed of David here, that God was going to raise up a horn of salvation in the house of David. And this Jesus is the one who is now entering into time here as the Israelite who's going to redeem God's people from their sins. So let's talk about Jesus, the Jew. There are a number of things that I want to describe to you tonight about who Jesus is and how he functioned within the framework of the Old Covenant as a faithful Jew, a faithful Israelite. The first thing is that 
along with the law, Jesus was circumcised. Now, we see this uh, in Leviticus 12, 3, is the commandment to circumcise all the males of their foreskin on the eighth day. And in Luke chapter 2, verse 21, it says, at the end of eight days, when he, Jesus, was circumcised, he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. So right from his birth, Jesus is the, he is following the Jewish customs. His parents, Joseph and Mary, are uh, establishing him in the Jewish way of life to observe the commandments of God. Next, Jesus attended the festivals. In Leviticus chapter 23, there are listed out eight festivals of the Lord. There's Sabbath or Shabbat, Passover, Pesach, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, Hag Hamatzot, Feast of First Fruits, Habikurim, the Feast of Weeks, Shavuot, the Day of Trumpets, Yom Teruah, the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, and the Feast of Tabernacles, Sukkot. And what we read about when Jesus was a kid in Luke chapter 2, it says, now his parents, Jesus' parents, Joseph and Mary, they went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up according to the custom. And when, he was, and when the feast was ended, as they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. See, as a child, Jesus is being trained in the ways of the Lord to follow under the covenant that God made with Israel, the old covenant, and to observe the feasts and the festivals that are instituted for God's people. In addition to that, toward the end of his ministry, Jesus also made special mention of uh, observing the Passover with his disciples. We find this in this, all the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It says here in Mark chapter 14, And on the day of unleavened bread, first day of unleavened bread, when they sacrificed the Passover lamb, his disciples said to him, Jesus, where will you have us go and prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he sent out two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. And wherever he enters, say to the master of the house, the teacher says, where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room furnished and ready. There, prepare for us. And the disciples set out and went to the city and found it just as he had told them. And they prepared the Passover. Something we have to keep in mind is that we don't have an exhaustive list of all the years of Jesus' life to know if he observed every single uh, festival or not. But the picture we do see from the scriptures is that he was raised observing the festivals and that he actually cared so much about that he was not going to miss the last one when he knew his death was coming so imminent. Also, Jesus upheld Torah, meaning Jesus spoke highly of the law. Here in Mark chapter 12... It says, starting in verse 28, And one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another, and seeing that he answered them well. This is referring to Jesus answered them well. He asked him, Which commandment is the most important of all? Jesus answered, The most important is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And the scribe said to him, you are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one and there is no other besides him. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength and to love one's neighbor as oneself is much more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. See, when questioned about the law and what is the greatest commandment, Jesus answered because he knew the law. He understood what God desired of his people. 
And he responded here to the scribe or the expert in the law and told him the answer of the two greatest commandments. And the scribe then confirms to Jesus, you know what you're talking about. You are right. And to do these two things is greater than all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices that could be offered. Next, Jesus also wore Jewish clothes, particularly tzitzit, meaning the tassels or the fringes that are supposed to be worn on the corners of the garments. This is a commandment we read in Numbers chapter 15. It says, speak to the people of Israel and tell them to make tassels on the corners of their garments throughout their generations and to put a cord of blue on the tassel of each corner. And it shall be a tassel for you to look at and remember all the commandments of the Lord to do them, not to follow after your own heart and your own eyes, which you are inclined to whore after. So you shall remember and do all my commandments and be holy to your God. Well, in an account in the Gospels, we read about uh, Jesus' tassels in a particular record here in Matthew chapter 9. It says, starting in verse 18, while he was saying these things to them, behold, a ruler came in and knelt before him saying, my daughter has just died. But come and lay your hand on her, and she will live. And Jesus rose and followed him with his disciples. And behold, a woman who had suffered from a discharge of blood for 12 years came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment. For she said to herself, if I only touch his garment, I will be made well. Jesus turned And seeing her, he said, Take heart, daughter. Your faith has made you well. And instantly, the woman was made well. Another record about Jesus' tassels can be found in Mark chapter 6. It says, When they had crossed over, they came to land at Gennesaret and moored to the shore. And when they got out of the boat, the people immediately recognized him. And ran about the whole region and began to bring the sick people on their beds to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he came in villages, cities, or the countryside, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and implored him that they might touch even the fringe of his garment. And as many as touched it were made well. Now, how do we know the fringes of Jesus' garment are actually the tassels of tzitzit? Could they just be the edge of his garment? Well, we know that they actually refer to the tassels because in Matthew chapter 23, Jesus speaks uh, antagonistically against the Pharisees regarding their fringes. Here's what it says starting in chapter 23, verse 1. Then Jesus said to the crowds and said to his disciples, The scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. So do and observe whatever they tell you, but not the works they do. For they preach, but do not practice. They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on people's shoulders. But they themselves are not willing to move them with their finger. They do all their deeds to be seen by others. For they make their phylacteries broad. These are boxes that hold little writings of scripture that they would tie around their arms and around their forehead. And their fringes, they make them long. These are the tassels. They make long tassels so that they can be very easily spotted. And they love the place of honor at feasts and the best seats in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces and being called rabbi by others. So Jesus wears the Jewish clothing, and he observes the commands of having the tzitzit, the tassels on the clothing, to remind him of the commandments of God. And so Jesus is is wearing Jewish attire like everyone else. He's following the customs of his people. Next, Jesus ate kosher. Now, we don't actually have any record particularly of Jesus saying 
that he stuck to a kosher diet and observed the dietary laws of the Old Testament that are found, I believe, in Leviticus chapter 11. But there is a passage of interest where he does talk about food. Here in Mark chapter 9, uh, which is not correct, it should be Mark chapter 7. And he called the people to him again and said to them, Hear me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him. But the things that come out of a person are what defile him. And when he had entered the house and left the people, so when Jesus now exits from the scene, he goes into a house, uh, his disciples then are with him in the house, and they ask him about the parable that he just spoke. In verse 18, and he said to them, then are you also without understanding? He expects the people to not really maybe get exactly what he's talking about. But his disciples, the ones who had been following him this whole time, that, that they don't get what he's saying, he's kind of perplexed that they would be without understanding regarding this matter. And so he says, do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile him, since it enters not his heart, but his stomach, and is expelled? <laughs> Thus, he declared all foods clean. And he said, what comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness, all these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. Well, there's a little context we have to bring into this record. You see, Jesus is being accused by the Pharisees for his disciples not washing their hands before they ate food. And so their qualm with him is a presumption that if you do not wash your hands according to the traditions of the elders, which is a type of body of law that was added onto the Israelite covenant laws, something that was developed later on, that if they didn't do that, that they were then eating defiled food. And eating defiled food, they would then presume, would then defile the person. And so Jesus is undoing this uh, accusation of theirs. And by saying that it's really not what you put in your mouth that defiles you because it doesn't actually go into who you are as a person. It doesn't affect your moral compass. It doesn't affect how you behave. He's saying what defiles somebody is when they act wickedly. From their heart come these desires, these ungodly desires, and that those are the things that really truly defile somebody. Now, we have to then ask, well, then, why does he then mention this last statement right here? Thus, he declared all foods clean. Well, actually, this isn't a statement of Jesus's. This is something that Mark, the gospel writer, adds on later to give an explanatory note. We call it an editorial comment by the, by the gospel writers. And we can understand a little bit more about why it's an editorial comment because we have a similar record in the Gospel of Matthew. So I'd like to go to the Gospel of Matthew and read that record because Jesus actually gives a point at the end that then addresses why he's saying what he's saying. Here it goes in Matthew chapter 15, verse 10. It says, And he called the people to him and said to them, Hear and understand. It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth. This defiles a person. Then the disciples came and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? He, said, he answered, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be rooted up. Let them alone. They are blind guides. And if the blind lead the blind, both will fall into a pit. But Peter, one of Jesus' disciples, said to him, explain the parable to us. 
And he, Jesus, said, Are you also still without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is expelled? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this defiles a person. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile anyone. See, this is the point Jesus is trying to make against the Pharisees, is that their oral tradition, the tradition of the elders that they were stipulating was as important as the Israelite covenant regulations. He's saying that those are not valid laws, that you can't soil, you can't corrupt your food. You can't make your food impure because you didn't wash your hands. And then if you eat that food, you yourself don't become defiled by it. Washing your hands does not change the nature of the food. So Jesus, while we don't see him stipulating a kosher diet, we do see him talking about food laws. And we do see him explaining that the way that the Pharisees were trying to add on extra laws to try to protect their, uh, uh, their uh, purity that Jesus undermines that whole enterprise, but he doesn't undermine the laws of Leviticus 11 where there are unclean foods and there are clean foods. He doesn't speak to those matters. But Mark adds an editorial comment when he writes later on during the growth of the early church when the Gentile community and the Jewish communities begin blending He writes a comment saying that Jesus declares all foods clean because Jesus is saying foods aren't really what matter. Yes, God gave laws to eat certain things and to not eat certain things, but what really matters is ethical conduct. Holiness is what matters. And one thing that comes to the problem if Jesus is actually doing away with food laws right here is that this makes a major problem for further records down the road where the Jewish community of Christians, particularly Peter, on the housetop uh, when he got the vision and then he tries to tell, the, tell God that he has never eaten anything unclean. If Jesus had told him that there was no such thing as unclean animals, it's then odd that Peter has such trouble and he has to have a vision repeated three times in order for him to get the point. And also further on the council in Acts 15 over the issue of eating foods also would not make a lot of sense if Jesus had already abolished that issue. And the uh, early church could have appealed to Jesus' statement here if, in fact, he was doing away with dietary restrictions. But he's not. That's not Jesus' argument here against the Pharisees. And lastly, Jesus observed the Sabbath. There are multiple records where Jesus is teaching in the synagogue or in the synagogue on the Sabbaths. One here, one is here in Matthew chapter 12. And it says in verse 1, At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry, and they began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Look, Your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. He said to them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry? And those who were with him, how he entered the house of God and ate the bread of the presence, which was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priest. Or have you not read in the law how on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath, and are guiltless. I tell you, something greater than the temple is here. And if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless, for the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. The first thing I want to point out in this record about the issue that the Pharisees have with Jesus' disciples uh, picking grain from a field on the Sabbath is that it actually has nothing to do with Jesus directly. See, the problem that the Pharisees have is not that Jesus is breaking the Sabbath. The problem they have is that his disciples are breaking the Sabbath, and he apparently is not doing anything about it. 
But what Jesus then says is that, don't you know in the law, in your law, of what David did when he was on the run from Saul? And he entered the temple with Ahimelech, and he got to eat the bread and those men who were with him because they were hungry? What Jesus is showing is the contradiction in logic of the Pharisees. That they were trying to point to Jesus and get him in a corner by not being stringent enough with his disciples about not working on the Sabbath. That taking grain from the field and rubbing it between your fingers to to, uh, rub off the husks to get the kernel out, that that was too much work. Well, there's a lot of problems that are arising here that uh, we don't have the exact background on because the type of traditions that the Jewish people saw regarding Sabbath work weren't formally uh, codified until about the 2nd and 3rd century A.D. But there is a little bit we can know from that to show kind of how uh, rigid-minded and how legalistic they were. Let me read you something about the ways that the Jewish people tried to uh, safeguard against doing too much work on the Sabbath. The law lays it down that the Sabbath day is to be kept holy and that on it no work is to be done. That is a great principle, but these Jewish legalists had a passion for definitions. So they asked, what is work? All kinds of things are classified to them as work. For instance, to carry a burden on the Sabbath day is work. But next to the burden, it has to be defined. So the scribe Olal then lays it down that a burden is food equal to the weight of a dried fig. It is enough wine for mixing in a goblet. It is milk enough for one to swallow. It is honey enough to put upon a wound, oil enough to anoint a small member of the body, water enough to moisten an eye salve, paper enough to write a customs house notice upon it, ink enough to write two letters of the alphabet, read enough, enough read to make a pen. And they did this endlessly. So they spent endless hours arguing whether a man could not could or could not lift a lamp and put it from one place to another on the Sabbath, or whether a tailor committed a sin and a violation of the Sabbath if he used a needle to stitch his robe, or whether a woman might even be uh, allowed to wear a brooch or a hairpiece, or even if somebody could go out on the Sabbath with artificial teeth or something on their body, a bag, or even if a person could lift their child up on the Sabbath. These were the things that seemed to them to be the essence of religion and holiness. Following the law to the exact letter, even going beyond it to making sure you didn't even get close to violating it. The legalism of the Pharisees was petty and it was filled with rules and regulations. And here they're trying to pin Jesus on one of those technicalities of, is it... Is it lawful to to get some grain and to rub it between your fingers? To them, no. That's a violation. They're doing work, and they're not allowed to work, and they're not allowed to eat. So Jesus is then going to show them that, hey, you guys are way out of bounds here. Because in the law, there are these, there's another time, and your precious King David actually did worse. He went into the temple itself. And ate the showbread that no one is allowed to eat. Because he was hungry. And because the men with him were also hungry. And they were nourished by that bread. And so then, why are you saying that my disciples are violating the Sabbath by gathering some grain for themselves? This is not the the only thing that Jesus did on the Sabbath. There's also another time that Jesus saw a man who had a withered hand. And he told the man to stretch his hand out. And the guy did. And Jesus healed the man instantaneously. A miraculous healing. And the Pharisees saw it. And they were outraged. They thought Jesus was violating the Sabbath by healing somebody. What did he do? He just spoke to the guy and he was healed. He didn't even touch him. But to the Pharisees, to these Jewish zealots, 
that to do anything like that was to violate the Sabbath. But Jesus never violates the Sabbath. But yet he still does good and he ministers to people. He puts people above the Sabbath. Also, there's another time when a woman who was uh, crippled by a spirit and Jesus lays his hand on her and she immediately becomes well. The spirit leaves her and she's healed and she stands up straight. And again, the Pharisees and the Jewish leaders can't believe what they're seeing. On the Sabbath, Jesus is healing somebody. That is not to be done. They even tell him, you can do it on any other day of the week. Not today, Jesus. So the Jewish leaders, they are so antagonistic to Jesus and they're trying to point to him as a covenant violator. But he's not. Jesus does not violate the covenant. In fact, Jesus keeps the law. Here's what, he's, here's what Jesus says in John chapter 15. He says, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Jesus testifies that he is faithful to God's covenants, the old covenant regulations that are mandated for the people of Israel. Jesus lived within those and operated within those. In John, 1 John chapter 5, uh, 3, verse 5, uh, John, writing about Jesus, says, You know that he, Jesus, appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. Jesus never transgressed the law. He never sinned against the covenant, against the commandments of God. This is also apparent in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, where Paul writes in verse 21, For our sake he, God, made him, Jesus, to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus was the faithful Israelite who never sinned. He lived a sinless life. This is what Jesus said in his famous Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5. Here in verse 17 he says, Do not Think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly, I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus makes a point here about fulfilling the law and that there's not a single dot, uh, iota or dot that will pass away until all the law is accomplished. And he's pointing to himself. He's saying, I didn't come to abolish the law or the prophets. I came to fulfill them. And there is not one part of them that will fall away or be unfulfilled until all is accomplished. His statement here about the smallest uh, letter, an iota or a jot, or the smallest mark, dot, uh, a tittle, these are just tiny little uh, marks on the letters of the Hebrew alphabet to distinguish one from the other. Jesus is saying even the smallest component of the law will not fail that all will be fulfilled according to God's plan and purpose. And so for Jesus, keeping the law was of the utmost importance because he was the Messiah, the one who was to come to save his people from their sins. And to do that, he had to fulfill the old covenant, the old covenant to the letter and to be the one to whom God was going to give the, house, the, the throne of the house of David to, and to establish a kingdom that would last forever. So Jesus, uh, uh, let me read one more, one more record in Luke chapter 16. It says that the law and the prophets were until John, John the Baptist. And since then, since John the Baptist, the good news of the kingdom of God is preached 
and everyone forces his way into it. But it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one dot of the law to become void. Now, this is not saying that the law and the prophets were in effect until John the Baptist. What this is talking about is that the law and the prophets and the prophecies and the promises that they were making were being given until John. When John came, John announced that the Lord was coming and that the time of promise was turning to fulfillment. And that in the time of Jesus, in the ministry of in the life and ministry of Jesus and the preaching of the kingdom of God, we have a transition from the time of the law and the prophets when they were prophesying of his coming to when he actually came and that he is fulfilling all that the law had written about him. And so Jesus, born of Joseph and Mary, was born under the old covenant. And he lived as a Jew, a faithful Jew, and fulfilled every prophecy that the law and the prophets wrote about him. And he never transgressed the law. He was the sinless one of Israel who will eventually give his life for the sins of all God's people. And so Jesus is the faithful Israelite under the Old Covenant.